you talk about defense in depth, I could go devolve into a discussion about the uh, the Patriots here, but I realize we may not have a lot of Patriots fans here. Team everybody loves to hate. Um, but much like the Patriots, the voice infrastructure is still under attack. I know this is going to come as a huge shock to everybody here. Uh, the difference today is that we're really in a world that's far removed from the early days of a lot of the infrastructure hacking that used to go on. Um, anybody remember Captain Crunch? The guy who actually used the, uh, the, the, the story goes, the whistle that turned up in a box of Captain Crunch that actually happened to be at just the right service frequencies uh, to be able to do toll signaling uh, or trunk signaling within uh, the, the early days of, of the phone system. Uh, the same kinds of things that drive a lot of that drive what uh, a lot of our largest risks in this left me space are today. Uh, there's a lot of money out there. And what we see from a lot of the activities from attackers in the, the marketplace at large uh, are that there are a ton of people who are willing to go try and make a buck off it. Uh, you get everything from Account fraud, which depending upon who you talk to, seems to be probably one of the largest loss areas currently in certainly consumer level services today. Uh, unauthorized access capabilities, there are a lot of things that are going on uh, with folks who are trying to gain access and pass traffic over networks that uh, aren't actually being paid for by them. Um, uh, both of those are, are very large areas of active loss today. Um, I'm going to make the point of slightly contrarian view that, in fact, one of the biggest risk areas that we have is a lot of the infrastructure that sits underneath it. Um, and we've got some examples in, in the field that actually uh, help to confirm some of this. Uh, it's an area where I think there's an underinvestment currently in terms of an understanding about what we need to manage um, and how we need to mitigate this in terms of a very large potential security risk. And it comes primarily from the fact that we're moving into an area uh, where we've traditionally had different sets of protections. Uh, we've had mechanisms that were well suited for an infrastructure that ran on a, a large percentage of largely proprietary equipment. As we start moving into broader types of services, um, you know, moving into IMS where we're looking at systems that are interconnecting with much more general purpose platforms, we open the door to a lot of the same risks that exist out in the much broader uh, data security space as well. So just as a couple examples, um, actually Bob mentioned the first of these. Um, Netophone was probably the carrier left holding the bag most predominantly in this, but it was something that affected a number of folks. Uh, what was happening in this case is that this gentleman in Miami was simply doing the regular business process of being a wholesale uh, minute reseller. He was going out selling access and calling packages and all sorts of things. And it just happened to be that at the back end, uh, he just simply wasn't paying for it. What he was doing was a classic infrastructure attack. The validation mechanisms to accept call traffic coming into the networks that he was hacking were simply using static codes to assign it. And the thing that doesn't get a lot of play and a lot of the stuff that was in the press is that one of the reasons why he was able to do it for as long as he could was because he had actually gone in and compromised the individual infrastructure devices that he was using to forward this traffic. So he was actually hacking routers that were passing this traffic so that he could hop his traffic through intermediate spots so that he was hard to track down and stop. Eventually, people were able to track back and find where he was. And uh, he's, I think, in the process of heading towards doing time. Uh, the thing that's also interesting about this hack is that what he did in order to facilitate it, he basically did the business front end of it, but he used traditional hacker style uh, attackers to be able to build out the infrastructure behind him. He built a business that was peopled on the technical side by some very traditional old line, you know, black hat style hacking uh, folks to be able to do that. 
What that means is that we're now in this world where a lot of that infrastructure, the stuff that we've been looking at from our regular internet access infrastructure, uh, facilities, protections, we've got to start looking at in terms of voice infrastructure as well. Uh, the year previous, um, the Greek call tapping uh, hack that went on, tremendously heralded because it was a very neat trick because of the fact that at the very back end of it, they were actually writing code for an Ericsson switch and taking advantage of the uh, legal intercept capabilities in the switch to be able to divert calls. A lot of the upfront stuff seemed to be fairly political, but uh, deeper analysis also seems to be pointing towards the fact that in many cases, they were actually trading on the Greek stock market for some of the decisions that were going on behind this. And again, one of the money trail issues that, you know, to date hasn't led them to anybody specific, but, you know, sort of raised a number of questions, uh, is whether or not, in fact, money was changing hands because of advanced information about Greek government legislation that was coming out that they were able to trade on well in advance of that information actually coming out. The situation in both of these is the fact that where there's money to be made, there's an attacker community that's more than happy to go off and try and make a buck on it. We've got some overt cases of that and, and some slightly less overt ones behind it. Um, as we move into much more expanded capabilities, as we start looking at you know, IMS as a way to now carry lots of different, much more expanded and potentially much more valuable uh, types of traffic across our networks. Uh, it also means that we're opening up the world to a much wider area uh, of potential abuse. We've now got a lot more stuff that's running on that network. So simply locking down um, our borders, making sure that the proxies that are carrying a lot of that traffic are hardened, that we're peering successfully with you know, our, our appropriate counterparts, the business partners. Uh, when you start looking at the capabilities that exist, uh, within, you know, tie span and the ability to interconnect these systems. Um, it's great to have these positions in place, but if you've got somebody who actually owns the server on which your axe validation is actually taking place, and they can go modify policies to suit whatever their particular call forwarding requirements happen to be, why bother trying to do any more sophisticated hack than that if they can get in and actually modify chunks of the infrastructure that are important to you?